Dear Professor Adeodatus, I trust this letter finds you in good health. I must confess I am scandalized by your recent claim that those who live in less than ideal unions, namely homosexual marriages, should not be admitted to Holy Communion unless they have first gone to confession with a firm purpose of amendment. How dare you treat the chalice as a prize for the perfect? Are you, my fellow colleague, worthy enough to receive the chalice of the Lord? And yet you advocate priests withhold it from those who do not share your orientation. Are there not good elements in these unions? Are these not humans made in God's image? Are these not people who have been baptized? Yet you would have priests withhold the medicine of immortality from them instead of allowing them to come to the table of the Lord for healing of their imperfections. Surely I need not remind you of the Lord's command, judge not, yet you judge and condemn. This is not the Lord's will. Rather, he would have us journey with them and accompany them and assist them in their faith journey. Stop worrying about observing rules and customs as the Pharisees were known to do, and concern yourself with love and mercy and understanding. Remember, the greatest commandment is to love your neighbor, and withholding communion from others, no matter what their imperfections, is not a loving act. It is with a sad heart I write these things. Sincerely, Professor Iscariot. Dear Professor Iscariot, I have received your letter, and I pray my letter in response finds you well. I must confess I am a bit perplexed by your subjective and superficial retort of my previous statement, that a soul should form their conscience according to the moral teaching through the divine and natural law. This notion that mercy is to be applied to an uninformed conscience without repentance and firm resolve to amend one's life is neither compassion nor is it merciful, but mere deception. Please do not bore me with your banal modernist thought, nor try to seduce me with the belligerence of your insolence. Was it not the great apostle St. Paul who said, Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord? Was it not the great St. Justin Mata who proclaimed regarding the Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things that which we teach are true? Now in regard to those who find themselves living in less than ideal unions, as you should know, good professor, that the Catechism clearly states, basing itself on sacred scripture, which presents homosexual acts as acts of grave depravity. Tradition has always declared that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. They are contrary to the natural law. They close a sexual act to the gift of life. They do not proceed from a genuine, effective, and sexual complementarity. Under no circumstance can they be approved. So, good professor, by their marriage they are stating formally and publicly, we do not believe what the Church teaches, and we plan to continue in this denial of the Catholic faith for the rest of our lives. Mercy and compassion does not equal full acceptance of every behavior that is contrary to the natural law. In regards to your question whether they are made in the image of God, I answer that with a resounding yes, and direct you back to the Catechism which claims, and I quote, The number of men and women who have deep-seated homosexual tendencies is not negligible. This inclination which is objectively disordered constitutes to most of them a trial. They must be accepted with respect, compassion, and sensitivity. Every sign of unjust discrimination in their regard should be avoided. Therefore, Professor, a distinction must be made between compassion and mercy. Journey with them? Yes. Accompany them? Yes. Assist them in the faith journey? Yes. That is compassion that we must show every soul no matter the fault that they struggle with. But as a good cardinal once said, Do not be deceived by the word mercy. God only forgives sins when they are truly repentant of them. In conclusion, it is those who withhold communion to avoid acts of sacrilege are the ones who are the merciful ones. Please say hello to the missus for me. Sincerely, Professor Idiotitis. Dear Professor Adeodatus, 
Perhaps this is a misunderstanding. I don't claim that people who live in less than ideal circumstances should not form their conscience through the divine and natural law. Rather, I'm claiming our understanding of the moral law can develop since there are some things in the past that were expressed according to the, quote, changeable conceptions of a given epoch, end quote, as the CDF has explained. You portray me as a modernist, but you know the modernists of the early 20th century denied the dogmas of the Catholic Church. Yet I affirm all of the dogmas of the Church. I and others who share my views affirm, doctrinally speaking, that these unions are not the ideal. However, the administration of the sacrament to people in such unions is a matter of practice, not doctrine. What heresy is being taught if we doctrinally affirm these unions are not the standard, yet administer communion and practice to them? What dogmas have we violated that we are slandered with the name modernist? My dear colleague, Denzinger is one thing, practice is another. You quote St. Paul to me, but he is referring to the withholding of communion to people who are in a state of mortal sin. Yet people in irregular unions can have mitigating circumstances that reduce their act from grave matter to a venial sin. Do you receive communion with venial sin on your soul? Yet you would have us deny it to others. This is the essence of the error of the Pharisees. They could see the speck of dust in the eyes of others, yet could not see the plank in their own. You quote the Catechism to me, but the Catechism merely speaks to this issue from an objective point of view. It does not address whether there are mitigating circumstances which reduce this intrinsically disordered act to a venial sin, and therefore makes the individual eligible for Holy Communion. Moreover, we both know one of the authors, namely Cardinal Schonborn, takes a much more merciful approach towards people in same-sex unions, and he expressed his favor for same-sex marriages and sees there is good in them. I leave you to meditate on St. Pope John XXIII's words at the opening of the Second Vatican Council, as you would do well to digest them. The Church has always opposed these errors frequently. She has condemned them with the greatest severity. Nowadays, however, the spouse of Christ prefers to make use of the medicine of mercy rather than that of severity. And he also says, The substance of the ancient doctrine of the deposit of faith is one thing, and the way in which it is presented is another. I challenge you to likewise apply the medicine of mercy over severity, and also to distinguish between doctrine and its presentation or practice. Sincerely, Professor Iscariot. Dear Professor Iscariot, Thank you again for your response. I have received your letter and I must say I find it to be a bit palter. You mentioned that I had misunderstood your claim, but I am afraid this isn't so since my objection to your original claim was that souls who enter into less than ideal unions are objectively committing an act contrary to the natural and divine law. As you know, Professor, the three conditions objectively must apply here. First, the souls entering into less than ideal unions is a grave matter to begin with. Second, they are deliberately willful in their decision. And last, they must possess full knowledge. I grant you the possibility of a lack of full knowledge according to church teaching. Therefore, it only proves my point that we should withhold Holy Communion until they have come to full knowledge of their decision. The pastoral approach here will be to journey with them in understanding and providing an opportunity of repentance and amendment before approaching our Lord in the Eucharist. We can also apply in this situation that you have so conveniently omitted in your argument St. Pope John Paul II's Familiaris Consortio regarding those in less than ideal unions. The Holy Father mentions that those living in less than ideal situations would practice, and I quote, to cease living together as if they were actually married, abstaining from those acts that are property to ideal spouses only. Also, that they may, and I quote, avoid giving scandal, that is, they avoid giving the appearance of sin, so as to avoid the danger of leading others into sin. Shall I also remind you of Veritatis Splendor? that is based on sacred scripture and the tradition of the Catholic Church on the existence of absolute moral norms that prohibit intrinsic evil acts and that are binding without exception? The encyclical teaches that there are acts that are always evil, which are forbidden by moral norms that bind without exception. 
The encyclical teaches that there are acts that are always evil, which are forbidden by moral norms that bind without exception. According to Veritati's splendor, with intrinsically evil acts, no discernment of circumstances or intention is necessary. Your explicit claim that the arguments of one state of grace belongs only to the person involved, since it is a question of examining one's conscience, and normally that would be true. But in Ecclesia Dei Eucharistia, it states that, and I quote, In case of outward conduct which is seriously, clearly, and steadfastly contrary to the moral norms, the Church, in her pastoral concern for the good order of the community and out of respect to the sacrament, cannot fail to feel directly involved. You continue on with the concept of mercy. But mercy cannot possibly mean the acceptance of an individual's action no matter how much it violates the moral norm because you simply don't want to admonish a sinner for the sake of sparing feelings. Mercy needs to be always seen in the light of eternity and withholding our Lord from the individual until they have made a decision not only to confess but to amend their lives completely before approaching our Lord is the true act of mercy since it does not place their soul in further danger. Tell the lads I say hello, and give the missus my best. Sincerely, Professor Ediotitis.